Hi, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry, from engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Today, we're going to be looking at a video by AI Telly on Oppenheimer's atomic bomb and how it works. I've been told this one is just the first bomb, the uh, little boy atomic bomb. Let's check it out. On August 6, 1945, this American B-29 bomber, a four-propeller plane named the Enola Gay, <laughs> I like that they the put a, their logo on for there. Hiroshima, Japan, carrying the uranium-235 gun-type bomb named Little Boy. Little Boy was one of the first nuclear weapons tested on mankind. While the dangers and the engineering behind it were even regretted by the scientist Oppenheimer, That's Julius true. Robert Oppenheimer was born on April 22, 1904. He worked on the Manhattan Project and was often coined as the This spelling of Manhattan, A-N, not E-N. Father of the atomic bomb. But the interesting part was later in his life, he fought to eliminate the production and development of nuclear weapons and died at the age of 62, 1967. Kind of like uh, the uh, Nobel Peace Prize, uh, Alfred Nobel inventing dynamite, thinking he'd get rid of warfare, he ended up creating something that revolutionizes warfare. Except worse, because nuclear weapons are even crazier. This is how the uranium projectile is launched at Whoa. 300 meters per second to initiate- That is a beautiful rendition. They did a great job, wow. For polonium for an extra explosion placed on the okay. tungsten carbide. We will also be looking at the nuclear fission of the neutrons explained in super simplified animations and not to forget the different blast radius zones of this first atomic bomb. So stay tuned and don't miss a beat. As we all know, the Manhattan Project produced two different types of atomic nuclear weapons, codenamed Fat Man and Little Boy. Atomic nuclear weapon. I've never heard it phrased that way. That's that's interesting. Well, oh, maybe the narration's done by an AI. Cool. This is the Fat Man atomic bomb. is a large, heavy plutonium imploded using shaped charges, as shown in the animations. While Little Boy has a less heavy uranium weapons triggered in a shotgun or gun type designs. The Little Boy has a length of 10 feet or 3 meters with a diameter of 28 inches 71 centimeters. While the Fat Man oh. has a length of 10 feet or 3.3 meters, but a much larger diameter of 60 inches or 1.5 meters. Comparing this to a person will help you understand its size. Cool. Even better, let's compare this to this classic American SUV as you see, both of the nuclear weapons look small, considering the amount of destructive power... Pa what SUV is that? I don't actually know. ...into it. This nuclear weapon weighs around 4,898 kilograms or 10,800 pounds. While the little boy, as the name suggests, weights just shy of 4,400 kilograms or 9,700 pounds. Before we dive into how this works, we have to understand the parts of the nuclear weapon. Starting from the back, these are the box tail fins meant to stabilize the bomb when dropped from this B-29 Superfortis bomber. These are the three electric gun primers. The primer is the device responsible for initiating the propellant combustion located here, also known as the chordate or conventional charge that will push this projectile at an explosive force. I was going to say, at this point, we're just describing a really big bomb here. We haven't gotten to the nuclear stuff yet. Moving ahead, this is the projectile tungsten carbide disc. And the most important part is the uranium-235 hollow projectile rings. It weighs around 84 pounds or 38.4 kilograms. The reason why they never tested this thing was... They ran out of uranium-235. This is the first big project where they enriched a whole bunch of uranium-235. And it's very labor-intensive. But they did test all the component pieces that he's listing to verify that the thing will actually go off. Now, this is contrary to the Fat Man, which they did test during the uh, Trinity thing. Now, because it mainly used plutonium, which you could make of more easily... And they also wanted to make sure their shaped charge worked in that case because it's a bit more of a more complicated design than just basically shoot hunk of uranium-235 to other hunk of uranium-235 and induce fission. 
while the front is the uranium target rings that weigh around 56.2 pounds or 25.6 kilograms. That is around 145.5 pounds or 65.5 kilograms of uranium. Closely note as it is very important to understand the projectile ring slugs are hollowed and designed for the target rings to enter. All these mechanism and parts are encased in a 6.5 inch or 170 millimeter smoothbore gun barrel. Moving to the front, this is the impact absorbing anvil. Just above it is the tungsten carbide plug. These are the four polonium initiators placed on the tungsten carbide. They are kept to make sure there will be a nuclear chain reaction when it is dropped and activated. Moving to the top of the structure. So that's all just to make sure that it hits the target. Nothing, nothing really weird happens with the target because nuclear reactions are super, super quick. So you just have to make sure the reaction occurs and you don't, you're not off by, you know, a few millimeters that the thing just fizzles out and doesn't even go off. Arming and fusing equipment. Let's move outside this atomic bomb to understand it better. These are the barometric sensing ports and manifolds. The barometer helps to identify the altitude at which the bomb is located so that it can activate this Archie fusing radar altimeter which is these curvy looking objects that activates before reaching the ground. Just above it is the electric plug and some refer to this as the arming wires. Now this is a key point. Um, you, they wanted this to detonate in midair to maximize the damage to the surface. That's also part of the reason why the, the uh, contamination isn't as bad as you would think for setting off a nuclear bomb because a lot of it's just gonna blow up into the upper atmosphere relatively harmlessly but this thing if it were to detonate on the ground it would contaminate a lot more of the ground and it would have just been a much much nasty of a thing to clean up but it wouldn't have caused as much damage to structure as the city it wouldn't have caused as much widespread fire so that's why they detonated at a certain high altitude to maximize immediate destruction from the weapon all that destructive power requires a platform to transport this nuclear weapon the answer is, is this B-29 Super Fortress. It was also the world's heaviest Such production cool plane. plane because of increases in range, bomb load, and defensive requirements. Boeing built a total of 2,766 B-29's Super Fortress planes, and it was the most advanced four-propeller-driven bomber of the Second World War. It has a length of 99 feet or 30.1 meters, with a huge span of around 141 feet 3 inches or 43 meters. Interestingly, the plane has a gross weight of around 140,000 pounds or 63,502 kilograms. It's a big plane for its and time. And could carry a 20,000 pound bomb. The bomb bay door is located just below the fuselage, and it can open them as shown in the animations. As stated, this is one That's of the cool. most fortified plane in that era. They're doing a really good job with a little animation, zoom in, cross sections. All that stuff's pretty good. It can carry around 12. 50 caliber of machine guns and remote controlled turrets as shown in the animation. That is super innovative at the time, having the guns being remote controlled. Uh, the B-17, also used during World War II, its gun turrets, you had to have a dude sitting in the thing to shoot. And that's a, that's a nervous position to be in. You're just in this little ball on this bomber having to fight off against enemy uh, fighters or interceptors coming after you. It's crazy. It also had a pressurized cabin, which was new at the time. Two below the plane, four above the fuselage, two remote control turret, one above and below near the tail. And the last two are located at the back of the plane. And that is one protected gunship. Now that we've established the B-29 super- Is it considered a gunship? They call some, did they call them gunships back then? When I think of aircraft gunships, I think of like an AC-130 or something. Someone who knows more about military stuff, let me know down in the comments fortress as a primary transport. Let's take a look at how this nuclear bomb works in basic step-by-step -step format. Here we go. Step number one. Before opening the bomb bay doors, all three arming plugs are pulled one after the other by the weaponeer William Sterling Deke Parsons. That's good. You have to have someone manually deploy it to arm it. And this kind of underscores um, a point I made in an earlier video about the misconceptions that if you set off regular explosive next to a nuclear weapon, it's going to blow up with its full force of a nuclear bomb. But nah, you got to, you got safety pins to pull. You got to make sure 
if you're going to set this thing off, it's going to be ready. Step number two. The doors open and the bomb falls due to gravity. Then it switches to its internal 24 volt battery and starts the timer. After 15 seconds, the bomb would be approximately 3,600 feet or 1,100 meters away from the aircraft. Step number three. The barometer senses the desired height of around 580 meters or 1,900 feet. As the little boy was designed to be an air burst above the ground. The membrane yep. closed a circuit activating the multiple radar altimeters located at the front of the bombs. The barometric stage was added because of a worry that external radar signals might detonate the weapon too early. Step number four. Did not, did not know about that, but I guess that makes sense, especially if you were going to strike a military target, even though this weapon targeted a civilian target. To ensure accurate detection of final altitude, multiple radar altimeters were utilized. This process involves measuring the altitude above the ground beneath the aircraft or the little boy through the timing of radio waves travel, reflection, oh, cool. and return. Once the correct height was sensed, the firing switch activates. Step number five. This ignites the three Navy gun primers in the breech plug. Step number six. This sets off the charge consisting of four silk powder bags, each containing two pounds or 0.9 kilograms of cordite. Step number seven. The uranium projectile will be launched at 300 meters per second toward the opposite end of the gun barrel. Step number eight. Four polonium initiators placed on the tungsten carbide initiate the nuclear reactions. Step number nine. This is where nuclear fission happens. The nuclei of certain heavy atoms split into smaller, lighter nuclei, releasing excess energy in the process. Let's dive a little bit deeper. The neutron strikes the nucleus and is absorbed. The absorbed neutron causes the nucleus to undergo deformation. The nucleus fission releases an average of two or three neutrons, thus that's, creating a chain accurate. reaction, or in some words, an explosion. The blast radiation. The chain reaction isn't an explosion by itself, but what, what's happening is the reaction is so fast. There's a term for that called prompt critical, which means the neutrons are spit out almost instantaneously, and the instant, near instantaneous neutrons by themselves are enough to create that, that sort of explosive reaction where it appears to be instantaneous. Like... I think in his video steps, I think, seven through nine, or whichever, um, would happen on the order of 10 to the minus eight seconds. Something like that. The, everything involving the, uh, the uh, fission portion, super, super quick. Uh, this is compared to fission in a nuclear reactor, which is delayed critical, which means these, those prompt near instantaneous neutrons by itself, do not cause the self-sustaining reaction. Your de d delayed neutrons come later, and they are responsible for keeping the chain reaction going, but it's slower. It, it's slow enough that you can actually react to it. We're talking on the order of seconds. So that is why that reaction just being way, way slower in a nuclear power plant compared to a nuclear bomb. And... The speed of the reactions is what causes the explosion, not it being a fission reaction by itself. It can be divided into several zones. The central blast zone has a diameter of 0.36 square kilometers, which is the extent of the fireball radius. This is the epicenter and experienced almost total destruction. Yep. Severe blast damage zone extends to around 4.5 square kilometers. This has severe damage to buildings, high casualties, and widespread destruction and radiations. Moderate blast zone is about 8.7. I think he's, to give his sense of severe, I think he's referring to 20 PSI overpressure. It's going to shatter mo most everything. And mo moderate's going to be like 10, and light's going to be like 5. So moderate meaning it's going to hurt and you're probably going to die any anyway since... This, this area is going to be destroyed, so no medical attention coming to your aid, but the uh, light one's going to be survivable. Square kilometers. Damage to buildings and radiation burn is still significant, but less severe. So radiation occurs independent of shock. We're just talking about shock waves here. Um, radiation would be a completely different um, circle you have going on.
Damage zone is beyond the blast radius. At 11 square kilometers, here there's fires, radiation exposure, and psychological trauma affected survivors among the thousands. I know that's not what he meant, but uh, I'm pretty sure the, the psychological drama of using a nuclear weapon extends far beyond 11 square kilometers. People are still horrific to this day about, about this weapon. Yeah, that's going to extend far beyond what the bomb is actually capable of. Simplify this through these animations. Once the correct height is sensed, the firing switch activates. The three Navy gun primers ignite the charge, consisting of four silk powder bags, each containing two pounds or 0.9 kilograms of cordite. The uranium projectile is launched at 300 meters per second. At this point, four polonium initiators placed on the tungsten carbide initiate nuclear fission reactions. In milliseconds, there will be an explosion damaging buildings and killing people by the thousands. Not milliseconds, um, 10 to the minus 8th. So if you're going to convert that to milliseconds, let's see, what does that figure out to? Milliseconds, 10 to the minus 3, so 1 100,000th of a millisecond? That's quick. That was a very, very well done 3D rendition. Prop to these guys for, um, I don't know what type of software they use, but really cool engineering type, uh, diagrams and stuff um and most of their most of their nuclear stuff was was pretty accurate just just thought i'd fill in a few things as I always do but hey if you uh support using nuclear technology for peaceful uses such as building nuclear power plants to produce uh, safe clean reliable nuclear power please join me on my journey to a clean nuclear energy future by liking subscribing and commenting Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.